Because I don't drive. Okay, just just leave when you need to, dear. Yeah, get your headset on. Oh, I don't want to take you away. No, I'm no, we don't have a great big group. It may get bigger because you know how good Unity people are about being on time. And we never know how big the group is out in the big wide world. So, all right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Hmm. Well, we know the truth, and the truth sets us free. And we remember that knowing the truth is not enough without living the truth. So I give grateful thanks this evening that each principle that we learn, each principle that we explore, becomes something that we not only understand at an intellectual level, but that we understand at the depths of our hearts, that it becomes a part of our spiritual DNA, so that the consciousness of prosperity continues to grow and to thrive in each one of us. For this I give grateful thanks. And so it is. Well, this is session five of six. Yeah, I noticed that. Barbara? Uh, no, I did too. Okay. So I didn't know if you wanted your prayer. Your well, it's recorded. It's We're just leaving the microphone on so the hearing device will work. Okay. I thought you, well, why do we have to use a hand microphone? So that it will, your voices don't get recorded too well by the microphone that's up here. So here we are at session five of six. And we're not going to do a review, a review quite like we did last week. Instead, we're going to start with a question. And I copied it right from the way it came over my cell phone, pretty much. And here was the question. If God is, and this is slide number two, if you're following along at home, uh, or wherever you might be, slide number two in the session five uh, PowerPoint, which is available at truthunity.net. If you got into the program, you can find the slides, and I do encourage you to follow along with us. If God is everywhere present and in everything, then my logic says God and substance are one and the same. God is spirit and manifests as material objects in human life, plant life, animal life, all life, substance is spirit, and manifest likewise. What's the difference? And my response, the difference might be looked at in the same way differences in frequency between sound or light waves is looked at. It has been said that everything is light vibrating at a different frequency. If we consider substance and light to be equivalents of a sort, then we have an image of how God's substance expresses differently as different creatures. All right, yes, Christine. Did you want to ask a question at this point? Go ahead. And for those of you who are listening from another place, if you're listening live to the class, you call 816-252. 4242. And you're right, Barbara, I didn't get the phone out of my office. 816-252-4242. Go ahead, Christine. Um, recently, from what I've heard, is that the scientists are saying that black in space is something. Yeah, I know, it's something, because there not is... Not just emptiness, and not just a void. So is that substance as well? Well, if what we believe about substance is true, then there is no absence of substance anywhere. However it shows up, it is still substance, okay? All right, so we continue. Substance is one of an infinite number of ways to speak of God or to speak of the one ultimate reality. In other words, 
The number of names of God is literally infinite because God is infinite. So whatever we can conceive of God to be, however many names we can make up for God, God will always be more. All right? Okay. So, now there was a follow-up question. This was a good discussion, and this is what class is really about. It's about interaction. It's not just a one-way presentation of, in of information. My basic question, the student said, is this. What is the difference between God and substance? I'm not sure my question was clear. So, my initial response, good question. The short answer is that different words speak to different aspects, activities, or ways of perceiving or relating to God or whatever name people use to describe ultimate reality. Some people find it helpful to use different words to describe the different ways they experience the presence or activity of God. Others don't. Always use what works for you. As a minister or teacher, of course, a person needs to be aware of different approaches, but in your personal practice, always use what works for you. Now, an Eric Butterworth example of this is one I love to tell um, about a woman who had a housekeeper, a live-in housekeeper. This was a wealthy woman, and the housekeeper was ill. She hadn't been feeling well for quite some time. And the woman said, uh, before she went away on one of her many vacations, she said, I'm going to give you a prayer treatment, and I'd like you to practice it every day while I'm gone, and you will feel better. And the prayer treatment was long and involved, something like mighty currents of God life flow into and through me now. I am whole and well in body, mind, and spirit. My, my life shows it, and you know, all of that. So the woman went away, and when she came back, her housekeeper was doing really well. She was chipper. She was healthy. So the woman said, my prayer treatment worked, didn't it? And the housekeeper said, well, to tell you the truth, I threw it away. She said, I tried to remember it, but I had no luck. And I got very frustrated. So one day I just tore the thing up, looked at myself in the mirror and said, oh, hell, I'm well. And I am. Now, Eric said, and he's right, it was not the phrasing, but the woman's emphatic energy on wellness that resulted in the demonstration. He said the oh hell part was her own creation and he's not gonna comment on that. But Eric is right, whatever works, okay? Whatever works. And I don't ever wanna tell anyone not to use whatever works. Pass the mic to Mary Lou, please. She has a question, all right. There is a, a part there. The basic question is what's the difference between God and substance? And, and there was an answer that you left out. I did, what was that answer? That answer makes sense to me. Okay. There is no difference. Okay. There is no difference. There so is no there difference is between God and substance. There is a way to describe God. I wonder, I, I had the same thing on my cell phone as you had on yours. I wonder why you I didn't do that. Yeah, well. And then you got that little one line which is a big difference. Well, read, read yours too. To the long one. But what was really, I need to hear. And I think other people need to hear too. Is there some difference? Okay. And we have different words to use. We, we, you know, I say my well and God, and other people say the Christ. Mm -hmm. Which is biblical things. Okay. So we use, we, we refer to the only spirit that is with different words depending on how that spirit is manifested. Within us, we say the Christ. It depends on our perception of how it's manifest in us, because that's what changes. That's what changes more than anything else. So, for it, in case Mary Lou didn't come through clearly, and if at any time you're not hearing well, just give us a call at 816-252-4242. I don't want to sound like a telethon, but I do want to make sure that everybody can access. Substance is a way of describing God, all right, along with many other uh, ways that we can use to describe God. Now, some people like to have all of those ways. As very often, well, here's an example from my own life. When my brother was about four years old, he picked up a pencil and a piece of paper and he started to draw. Now, his drawings were very good. When we consider that he was only four years old, they were astounding. 
So what did we do? We went out and we bought him a set of colored pencils, probably 30, 40 colors, and an artist's sketch pad, really nice one. And what did he do? He took a piece of that paper and a number two pencil and started to draw because at that time in his life, that's what he did. Now he went to art school, graduated, and has had a successful career as a commercial artist. But we must always be aware of what works for us. And if I or anybody else comes along and wants to share with you more than you are willing to receive at this point, thank us for sharing and use what works for you. If it stops working, you know, like sometimes a pair of shoes gets too tight, then you look for something else. But until it stops working, there's no reason to mess with it. For people who have to have the latest, greatest idea that came down the pike, what we end up with is a whole library full of ideas that we don't understand really well because we aren't using them. Vicki, did you have something you needed? Yes, you did. I did. Um, we talked some on Sunday about what we well, it's true in substance, and we come. I think probably now, but um, we talked about the fact that spiritual substance is not the same thing as the way we've grown up using it. It's quite the opposite, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So that helped me to understand it. But then I came up with this notion of why did we use the term substance in the first place? What's the advantage? of seeing God as spiritual substance. The advantage to seeing God as spiritual substance, for those for whom that works, is that this gives us an understanding of how things come into expression. All right? We take the divine energy, the formless substance that God is, and through the activity of our minds and hearts, our Christ qualities, we give it shape and we give it form. We bring it into expression. At the heart of it is the divine idea, the substance that it represents. What we see is the outpicturing. It's good for some people at least to know what it's really made of at its core. All right? We might say that our cars are made of steel and fabric and rubber and uh, plastic and, and glass and whatever else goes into the making up of a car. There are quite a few things. But what is the essence? The essence is the divine idea of transportation that has really come to a sophisticated point of view. So humankind clothed divine substance and came up with a vehicle. Okay? She's got more to say. I do. I finally get it. It means it stands under what's at the root of it, okay? Which is spirit. Which is spirit. Okay. And I've, I've, you've probably heard me say in the almost year we've known each other that uh, at the end of at the end of the current chapter of the evolution of humankind when we have done all the things we need to do to become ready for the next stage, the sum total of human spiritual knowledge will be condensed in a single word, and that word will be one. Very often we have to travel far afield and gather a lot of knowledge before we can come back and see one for what one is. Every now and again, I get a fleeting glimpse of it uh, for far less than the shutter speed of a camera. I know it's there. I know it's coming, that awareness. I have no idea how soon. As long as we take every step as consciously as we can, we will arrive. It can't be otherwise, okay? Now, we're not done because what happens here well, first, I do appreciate the dialogue more than I can say. It is in the give and take of interactions like these that the greatest learning takes place for both you and for me. It's when people stand up and say, hey, this isn't working, that I have to go to uh, my deeper understanding and come up with something that does work. 
In my new job uh, working with the uh, substance abuse treatment clinic, I was surprised one day when uh, a schedule was confused and I was going to give a lecture on religion and spirituality, except that the only one who knew about it was the person, the, the counselor, uh, in whose group I was going to do it. So I showed up about 10 minutes before that time to discover what I was about to do. As it turns out, it was a good learning experience for me and for the group because they started asking questions and that's where the good stuff happens and that is why I, I sometimes practically beg people to make comments to ask questions if something's not working say so all right so this discussion about spiritual substance brings up an even more basic question that I'm now asking all of you it's a three-part question First question, how do you perceive God or ultimate reality? Do you perceive God as a supreme being located pretty much outside of yourself? Do you perceive God as beingness or being itself? This is slide number seven. If this is your perception, where is this beingness located? Are you simply aware of something greater than your human self without pursuing the question much further than that? Do you have a different perception of God or ultimate reality that you'd like to share with the group? And I'd love to hear from anybody on the phone, too. Mary Lou, you're first in line. But first, I want to give the phone number once again, 816-252-4242. Go ahead, Mary Lou. We have a vocabulary again. Okay. Beingness or be yourself, as many of you do. Yes. So you use words. I do. As nothing's earning. Okay. So my answer is not your own. All right, what is your answer? My answer is I perceive God as my life itself. You what? I perceive God as my life itself. As my life itself. Okay. All right. I write with itself. All right. As my life, I breathe, I feel alive. My wholeness. The fact that I'm alive. Say that again. The fact that I am alive. All right. The fact that you are alive is evidence of God for you. All right. And do you go farther with that uh, to look at the um, presence of God elsewhere than as your life? For sure, God is everywhere present, so it's present in you. God is present in Christine and manifests in Christine. Okay. The heat manifests the fire, manifests the soul, manifests the dog, manifests my dogs, manifests everything living. Okay, manifests. and that works for you. Mosquitoes. Mm hmm. All right. And that works for you. All right, Christine. Um, God is kind of ephemeral to me. And for me, substance, as we talked about, is or God is 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 light. Is uh, not just light. Is hold it up to your mouth a little prism, closer. Is the prism of all light, mm -hmm. and the light is within me in every cell of my being. In, in everything, in this chair, in, in all of you, in plants, in, in the earth, everywhere present. All right. That's how I feel. It's, it's, it's divinely intelligent, it's divinely joyous, peaceful, loving. Okay. You're getting on to part two of the question, actually. <laughs> So if anybody else wants to add there, Barbara does, right behind you. Well, honestly, Closer up. It, it, it's, it's really all of that. I mean, I, I relate to Renu and, and Christine. It's, it's just, there's no, there's no words that can really convey it. I think what gets in my way with them Sometimes as I know that God is my life, I know that God is the creator, that is within me, that I am the creator. But when I am not coming forth with that being or goodness, you 
Okay. It must be the substance. And um, it just really, it gives, it's, it's, I think it's in part of the quest. Okay. It's okay. And that's why I'm asking the question, because it is a part of the quest, and our awareness, well, that's part three of the question. We don't want to get there yet before we get to part two. But thank you. Thank you all who shared it. Vicki, you want to jump in too? Um, all of the above plus energy and the source of all energy. All right. Which is kind of my idea of substance. All right. Okay, good. There's good thought going on here. I have a question for Richie. You said all of the above, so you believe the one. Do you yeah. receive a oh, thank you for her? Yeah, when she said all of the above, she meant what the, uh, the rest of you had said. Now, uh, I recently, just today as a matter of fact, watched a film that I'm reviewing. It's called What is New Thought? It's a fabulous film. Um, I was really blessed by it. And one of the things that I noticed, I don't know how many people noticed this, but there were more than 40 different speakers in the film, New Thought ministers and teachers and musicians and throw in uh, Wally Amos. You remember the famous Amos Cookies. He's aged really, really well. He's a, he's a very mellow senior citizen now. And uh, Rev uh, Reverend Della Reese Nett. She is a minister in her own right. We, I heard um, discussions of God that were very much outside of me and yet meaningful to the speaker. And I heard discussions of God that were uh, um, even more esoteric than the terminology I tend to use. So it's very interesting that people with different concepts of God can very definitely live and work together quite nicely. It really does work. So, part two, how do you relate to your perception of God? Do you experience a closeness that can sometimes be called oneness? Do you experience a feeling that God cares deeply for you? Do you experience a feeling that God is sometimes or maybe even often disappointed in you? I should have said in there. And do you experience God through your interaction with people, animals, nature? So how do you relate to your perception of God? And some people don't relate at all, and they're honest enough to admit it. God is just sort of there, like Mount Everest is there. I don't relate to Mount Everest. Or maybe you do. Go ahead. Do you experience a closeness that can sometimes be called oneness? Do you experience a feeling that God cares deeply for you? But I'm not into understanding that God is my life. Uh -huh. A lot of every cell. And the, well, the question is, this, well, what's this stuff about God loves you? So my intellectual explanation to satisfy myself is that God loves expressing as me. Okay. And God loves expressing as each mm -hmm. one, each living, loves that experience of itself. Uh, the third question, the answer is no. The third the question is, do you experience a feeling that God is sometimes or maybe even often disappointed in because you? Because if, if I did that, if I believe that, then I would have to believe we were separate. Mm -hmm. that God was my life. I'm not sure how my life could ever be disappointed in, in me. It doesn't confuse, so I would say the answers, no. And uh, do I experience God in interaction with people? Animals and nature sometimes. Sometimes they do, they're not in a level of nature, but not always. Okay. Okay, I'm going to see you on a different answer. Um, 
close. Right up close. There we go. No. I feel that the love is continuous. There is no disappointment. All right. And I do feel, especially in nature, I feel with God. But also, whenever I'm silent, especially in nature, by a tree, by, a, by an old tree, by a grove, mm -hmm. um, the sky, not so much people, sometimes with people. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, Vicki. Okay, well, you see the stock change, but originally, <laughs> I don't know about those four items was that when God cares and God has is capable of being disappointed, my reaction was that that's a sort of personality or person view of God. What <laughs> it tickled me. I saw on a church marquee that the statement even God has a fish story. And I thought that's that's the kind of God those two are, those two little items are talking about. And then as Christine was talking, I realized that I was saying to myself, yeah, I don't think God is disappointed in me. I think I handle all that perfectly well to be disappointed in myself. But then I thought, but if I am God expressing, then I would have to say yes to that. Okay. So then um, the last one, like Christine, I really sense, through nature especially, a wonderment. And with animals, the same thing. People I struggle with. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now on to question three. I think this is a worthwhile dialogue. I hope you do too. Oh, do you experience God in more than one of the, these ways? Of course, some of you do. And do you experience God in some other way? I didn't roll down all the choices I should have. There were more than I gave you. All right, do you not experience God consciously at all? That, that I did put in. So I just didn't roll down all the choices. Uh, there are people who do not experience God. I don't know that I did experience God until I was 35 years old, not consciously anyway. Christine? I, I just wanted to say one thing about your first set of questions. With beingness, um, to me, it's more like consciousness. All right. To me, beingness has, has a shape. Okay. Consciousness doesn't. Suppose I said isness. Isness? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You like isness, but you don't like being there. Isness is only now, but God is all past, present, future. Ah, okay. What if there is only now? Well, there is in the light of the greaterness, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for thank you for engaging me in this discussion because this this is, you know, this is what's uh, better for me than some people sitting down and talking about batting averages or NASCAR. This is where this is where I get my fun. So thank you. Part three: Is your God awareness evolving over the course of your life as you remember it, or even over the course of the past few years? Has your awareness of God changed, evolved in any way? If you have experienced an evolution in your God awareness, can you describe how your awareness has changed? Hmm? Anybody? Um, no, this time I don't. I appreciate you keeping me honest. I always, I always appreciate that. Okay, yeah, I was in the line talking about the weekend. Uh, yes, definitely, the course of my life has certainly reversed her to the word God at whatever age it was. My perception has changed. I think I like using this matter because. Is is very much a verb. Mm -hmm. Being, uh, maybe my studies, being wasn't so much a verb. Okay. Uh, and, and so, is this, there's probably, I relate to is this because is is definitely a verb. And God is an activity. 
they need all kinds of activity. And uh, in recent years, I don't know how recent, um, but as I, I came to the full awareness, the belief system that God was my life itself, and my intellect kicked in my logic. And I said, well, then God's also my strong limit. And God is also my going back. And strong and healthy. And God is my my main word is to do this. All right. I just abandoned the project halfway through. And my big challenge is mowing my backyard. Right now can be a challenge, but nothing like that. So I got the issues resolved in my home. And uh, probably for now, I'm going to throw in two to two and a half years. I have been affirming, and so I've proven myself that God is my life. Because the molecules and the cells of my body wouldn't respond that God was alive to my affirmations. Mm -hmm. God is my energy. Okay. And I'll go out and then go around the with the gasoline, and my tail is kicked. And I'm sneezing, my eyes are watering. Too bad, clay is stuck in my purse. And I keep firm. God is my energy. God is my life. God is my strong legs. And my body kicks in and I come in. I finish the job. I come in the house and I continue working for several more hours. You know, the Sunday, I, Saturday, I didn't go outside and mow to five o'clock. And typically, it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to mow the back. Mow the back of every time it is like an hour or less than an hour. Came in, it's all good. I brought for Sunday. And all kinds of stuff filled with energy. Good. So I, it works for me. Mm -hmm. Now, is it going to work for you or for Vicky or for Phil? Well, this is, you know, you this is perhaps the most important element of the discussion. Does it work for you? And that's all that's important. Yeah. Now, you have to be honest about whether it's working for you or not. Have we ever defended an idea because we've had it a long time, or maybe because we thought it was original with us, but it's not working anymore, and we don't want to admit that it's not working anymore because that would mean that we made a mistake. Well, the fact is we didn't make a mistake. It was quite suitable for its time, for its place when we came up with it or when it came to us. Just because it isn't suitable anymore does not mean that it was not suitable then. About a year, maybe two years ago, there was a, a cute little advertisement on TV, a commercial, about a couple who had a son who looked to be in his early 20s, and they were trying to give him a bath in the kitchen sink. Now, they tried to give him a rubber ducky to play with, and he didn't want to play with the rubber ducky, and his mother said, you used to like to play with the rubber ducky, and I, I was drawn to that because I was once given baths in the kitchen sink by my grandmother. Well, the idea is what worked for us then doesn't work for us now, and there's a corollary to that. What works for us now may not work for us tomorrow. That's what Charles Fillmore was saying when he said, I reserve the right to change my mind. There are those truth teachers who believe they've got it, the ultimate truth. And I will say the ultimate truth is a destination that does not get any closer or farther away so long as we stay in the process. All right? Some people don't like hearing that because they want to win the game. And that's the metaphor that we must stop using, in my opinion. In my opinion, the metaphor is being in the flow. And this is a prosperity class. Part of prosperity is currency. And when we think of currency, we must not think solely of money, but we must think of the movement of energy. Where there is movement of energy, there is the creation of abundance. There's a couple more things I just want to touch on briefly before we go to tonight's chapters. Prosperity is a state of consciousness, not a financial condition. Your money is not the best gauge of your prosperity. Some people with lots and lots of money aren't prosperous, and some people with very little money are. Second, every person is responsible for his or her prosperity consciousness. 
We can't control the events of our lives, but we can and do control how we respond to those events and circumstances. Because we have the ability to respond, we are response-able. So no one can make me feel any particular way without, no, even if I give them my permission, they're not doing it. I am. I'm taking what they said, internalizing it, and using it in a way that pulls me down. Next, to the degree that we become the conscious executive directors of our thoughts, feelings, and actions, we build a strong prosperity consciousness. But we only do it by taking command. That was the title of an old Unity book from several generations ago. Take command. And right where you are is the only place from which you can build a prosperity consciousness. I will be prosperous when is a self-defeating thought. The only place you can begin developing a prosperity consciousness is here and now. Got it? These are important key concepts of this book and of this course. So, next, gratitude. The great full mind and heart is an essential building block of a prosperity consciousness. We are not talking about being thankful for any particular thing, but about a generally positive, joyous attitude toward life. That's the great full mind and heart. And I say mind and heart because too often in New Thought and in Unity, we have separated the mind and heart when they are not separate at all. They work as a continuum and the energy flows between them. The heart space and the head space, the constant flow, metaphorically, because it flows in consciousness, all right? Two more points. The first is the universe owes you a living. All that is necessary for every person to thrive and prosper is available and needs only to be unlocked. I would say that on the floor of Congress if they'd let me, because I know it's true. I absolutely know it's true. We limit the flow. We human beings do. There's enough for everybody. But in our fear and in what is our self-protection, we limit the flow. You owe the world a life. If the universe owes you a living, you owe the world a life. You've got your stuff, you've got your gifts, you've got your resources. So it's your responsibility and it's my responsibility to do something with them. What that something is, is totally up to each one of us. But do something there's another key to prosperity. Do something. Good? All right. Now, on to chapter nine, the money enigma. And it's the money enigma, not enema. All right? Hmm? We did the seventh and eighth last week. So now we're on chapter nine. Have I had a time of financial stringency and cried out, I need money. Actually, it could be said that my money needs me. If I constant, consciously imbue my money with the idea of abundance, it will begin to work for me in a positive way. Suddenly, the seemingly little supply becomes dynamic seed money, giving rise to unbelievable increase. So next time you open up your wallet or wherever you keep your currency, the next time you look online at your bank statement because you don't carry cash, just your bank card, you use it for everything, ask yourself, what are your thoughts about it? Okay, what are your thoughts about that money? It's said in a, one of the letters that Paul himself did not write, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say that the love that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by the love of money, it means making money your God. If your life is about making money, if money is your ultimate goal, then yes, you are prone to all kinds of challenges. 
There's a book called Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow. Uh, there's scripture that says, seek first the kingdom of God and the right use of the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you. We have King Solomon who prayed to God for an understanding mind and heart. He got those and he also got unmeasurable wealth. How do we think about our money? Do we think about it as something that we have to hold on to tightly or it'll be taken from us or do we think of it as evidence of the flow. You remember Scrooge McDuck, don't you? Donald Duck's uncle, who had an amazing amount of money, but was always worried about it being stolen. He actually had a money bin. This uh, room that had a thing in it like a swimming pool, even had a diving board. But instead of water, it was filled with money, bills and coins, He'd swim around in it. Actually, doesn't sound appetizing at all. Okay. More than money, I need faith. I need a flow of creativity. I need ideas. I have always within me the inlet that may become the outlet to all there is in God. I just haven't fired it up when I'm not experiencing abundance. So what is money? It's a symbol. It's an enabling symbol. Money's not the energy. It's a symbol of the energy. It's a tangible representation of something intangible. Now here at Unity of Independence, when the staff gets paid, nobody hands us a check. We just look at our bank balance. It's gone up overnight. Wow, that's fun. I like that. I don't even have to go to the bank and put it in. It's just there. Anybody who receives a, a social security check, and honestly, I think probably uh, a growing number of employers pay their employees this way. They never see any green stuff. I once had a job where you got a pay envelope every week with actual cash in it, but that was 50 years ago. Um, you never had that? 50 years ago. Yeah. I'll be 50 years out of high school next year. Okay, so it's a symbol of universal substance which enables you to provide food, shelter, clothing, entertainment, books, leisure, and security against want. Okay, that's what money is. It's an enabling symbol. How does it do this? Well, I guess you could build a house out of paper dollars. That would be a terrible waste. And certainly you shouldn't eat the coins unless they're chocolate Hanukkah coins. Or some other kind. You, you've, you've had chocolate coins somewhere along the way, haven't you? Usually wrapped in gold foil. It's a very big thing around Hanukkah. They call it Hanukkah gelt. It's an enabling symbol that gives rise to faith and trust, credit and cooperation, which starts a flow of activity. You know what they say, money talks. All right? When you look at Craigslist for the things that people have to sell on Craigslist, um, first... $500 takes it. Somebody walks up with money, they're going to go away with the piano or the TV set or the motorcycle or the car or whatever it is that's for sale. Okay. So here's the example. I take 50 bucks and hand it to the grocer. And he gives me some food. He gives the money to the food distributors and they give the money to the suppliers and they give the money to the farmer who uses the money to buy seed and feed. Round and round it goes in a process that we call the economy. But in back of it all comes the basic substance of life harnessed and directed by the activity of faith. You see? The money is a way of tracking what's going on. As the money passes from hand to hand, stuff happens. All right? Money doesn't always represent abundance. Matter of fact, often it doesn't. Money is a symbol of lack. We measure ourselves up to a standard we aren't meeting. We come up short. Produces anxiety. Figure on your paycheck. 
might symbolize injustice, they don't pay me enough, unappreciation, they're not aware of how valuable I am, and insufficiency. How can I live on this salary with all the rising costs? You look at the paycheck and instead of being joyous, you're a little annoyed, or maybe more than a little annoyed. Here I am working my butt off for this pittance. You probably felt that way. You probably didn't do too well on that job. But when we turn it around, well, things do change. Green side up, Eric says. Your money is an extension of you. It's a symbol of limitation or limitlessness according to how you think while you use it. Think green. Keep the green side up. Make that identity with money uh, an identity with a symbol of limitless God's substance. Kind of cool when you do it that way. When you pay for what you buy proudly, Yeah? I mean, it's the same money, whether you're hanging on to it tightly for fear of losing it or circulating it joyously because you really are in tune with the substance that it represents. And by the way, if you ever need a quick prayer book, let's see if I have one here. Yeah, I think I do. Just pull out a dollar bill because a dollar bill is a prayer book. Did you know that? Well, more than that, oh goodness, in God we trust is a good place to start. And, you know, huh? The eye and the ears. Yeah, 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 let's look at all of that. If you have a dollar bill, you heard the story perhaps about the two bank notes in the wallet. There was a 20 and a 1, and the, uh, the $20 bill was talking about all the wonderful places it's been, restaurants and uh, theaters, and it's gone through a couple of gas stations. And uh, it says to the $1 bill, where have you been? I'm huh? just church and AA meetings. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. It's a tradition to put a dollar in the plate. Uh, but you look at this, in, in God We Trust is right there, if you have a $1 bill, and right under that, it says one, in great big letters. One, O-N-E. I love it. On the left side, that Latin caption, annuit captis, means God looks with favor upon our enterprise. The founders of our country were all rather uh, metaphysical people. And underneath the pyramid, where the pyramid is, is, a bro is in two places, at the top is the all-seeing eye, a new order of the ages is, uh, you're on the wrong side, Christine. There you go, green side up. A new order of the ages, Novus Ordo Seclorum. On the right side, you see the eagle, of course, and in his left talon, he's got arrows. In his right talon, he's got an olive branch representing peace. In his beak, he's got a ribbon that says, A Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. And above his head is a star of David with 13 stars in it, all right? The Star of David is a very metaphysical symbol. It's two triangles superimposed on each other. One points up and the other points down. A symbol of the ongoing flow, okay? So a dollar bill is a prayer book. The first thing I do when I pray with a dollar bill is look at that one. And I take the in God we trust and I change it just a wee bit. I say, within God, I trust. Within God, I trust. Okay? Because I know that I live and move and have my being in God. Let's continue. Your money needs you. Your creative ideas to become of use to you. It needs your faith and your vision. It does. You see, you have the choice. You might not have enough money to need to meet the need, but you always have the inlet that may become the outlet to all there is in God. Ooh, 
You do. You absolutely do. The world is full of stories like those 20, 19 or 20 year old college kids who um, were sitting around a dorm room uh, thinking of ways for college students to communicate with each other more effectively. Facebook was born, neither one of them is 30 yet, and they're both multi-billionaires. I mean, really, it's in every one of us. As you become centered in the flow, you create the condition in consciousness that makes the result inevitable. You're never farther than one idea away from all the wealth in the universe. Vicki, you look like you don't believe that. I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything you want to add here? No, it's just so Okay, good. Now, one of the things that I, I, I confess, I've had this response to this chapter. Okay, so why haven't I demonstrated more of it? And I could go on thinking about that question for hours, but you know what? That's a useless endeavor. My useful endeavor is what am I going to do with the next 10 minutes? That's my useful endeavor. When, I mean, I say I believe these things, and a great big part of me does, and I'm working with the deeper, visceral beliefs that work against it, I do what I can with what I have right where I am, and each step brings me farther along the path. Now, how do we get there? Well, chapter 10, my favorite chapter in the whole book. Discover the wonder of giving. This is not where we take up the offering. In a sense, we're taking up the offering all the time. Eric says, Meister Eckhart gives the key. God never begot but one son, but the eternal is forever begetting the only begotten. All right? I have my own unique flow of the divine. Whoa! I'm seeking to establish myself in a unitive relationship with the divine flow. In other words, I want to be one with it. I can't achieve this level of consciousness until giving becomes the main thrust of my life. Do you remember hearing a song about a well in the desert that had been discovered and drilled by a man who called himself Desert Pete? It was an old-fashioned well, just a pump handle and a bottle. A bottle filled with water with a note attached to it. And the note said, friend, you've probably come a long way and you're thirsty. You have two choices. You can drink the water in this bottle and you'll be quenching your thirst for a little while. Or you can use the water in this bottle to prime the pump and then pump out as much water as you want. Wash yourself with it. Drink with it. Do whatever you need to do with it. Water your animal with it. But please leave the bottle full for other people. And that's the way it works. We get all the flow we need when we prime the pump by giving. We put ourselves in the flow. Do you see? Oh, it's fascinating. Now, Eric talks about two kinds of people in life. The first is the taker. The one who dies with the most toys wins. Life will always be the total of what I can get from the world. And, you know, there are folks who even want to take it with them. You can, you can be buried in a casket, a beautiful hardwood casket, casket that will cost you $20,000 just for the casket. And you pay a lot more for the rest of the funeral. Whatever good it'll do you, I really don't know. And I apologize to the funeral directors. They're entitled to earn an honest living. The taker is always thinking, get, get, get. He plans and schemes ways to get what he wants in money and love and happiness and in all kinds of good. And he might even be applying metaphysical techniques, and many do. But they still may very well be a taker. And if, if he is a taker, well, whatever his spiritual ideas or lack of any, 
regardless of what he takes, he cannot know peace or security or fulfillment if you're just thinking, get, get, get. I got a catalog in the mail. I have no idea why I got it. Maybe it wasn't addressed to me. It could have been addressed to occupant. It was from a company that shall remain nameless that sells the most incredible gadgets, almost none of which are really necessary and just about all of which can be purchased for less money from somewhere else. But this is a prestigious business and people like having their stuff around. I suppose, no, I don't anymore. I used to like having their stuff around. Now it just clutters up my space. Okay, the giver. The giver is convinced that life is a giving process. His subtle motivation is to give himself away in love, in service, in all the many ways he can invest himself. You're not burning yourself out, you are investing yourself. You're always secure because you know that your good flows from within. And you develop a you, you develop a consciousness of giver and then you begin to see the sense of life, to see the real pattern of life. It could mean a complete turnaround in your approach where you think give instead of thinking get. You're seeking to establish yourself in that relationship of oneness which you cannot do until giving becomes the main thrust of your life. And when it does, when you discover the wonder of giving, then you are, as he says, unblushingly an incurable giver. Now, he's not going to be talking about constantly writing checks to your church or his church or any other organization. That is a form of giving. It is not the only form of giving. Do we see? All right. Let's continue with the slides. Meditate long on this point, he says, for it's one of the most important keys of the prosperity law. Life is a giving process. There are many channels through which your giving may be funneled. Now, I know how I know some of the ways that some of you give. I don't know them all. But you're people with a giving consciousness. You are about giving. This does not mean that you cannot receive. You must receive. But your focus is on giving. And in the giving, you know that your needs are taken care of. The model for the giving consciousness is Charles and Myrtle Fillmore's covenant made on December 7th, 1892, where they literally gave everything they had to the living spirit of truth and through the living spirit of truth to the society of silent unity, believing that every one of their needs would be met and met abundantly. And of course they were. But this is difficult to understand. Their second son, Rickard, remembers when he, he and his older brother, uh, he was eight years old, his brother Lowell was 10, and Royal, the third son, was uh, uh, just a baby. He was three years old. So he wouldn't have understood. But Rickard hears that we've given everything we have to God and the first thing he thinks is, oh boy, there go all my toys. And Santa's not going to come this year. You see how that consciousness gets into us at an early age, but not everybody. I hear of little kids who tell their parents, no birthday gifts for me this year. Instead, I want to do something for whatever their favorite project is. I won't call it a charity because it's a project. It's an investment in people an investment that looks for ways for folks to get themselves into the flow. There are many channels through which we can give, almost a never-ending supply of them, all right? We're talking about the basic awareness that life is a matter of unfolding from within. 
It's not stuffing ourselves full. It's about letting out what is already there. How many of us have uh, computers that we don't fully know um, the, the different ways we can use them? Just two weeks ago, yeah, just two weeks ago. Now, people consider me a pretty much power user. There was a couple in our, our community here who had their computers stolen. And I had a spare computer, not a new one, and it had some stuff on it that I didn't really want to get rid of, and it was private stuff. So how can I give them this computer to use and still keep that stuff? Well, in my decision to give, I discovered something I should have known years ago. You can set up different user accounts on the same computer where one can't see what the other has put in there. Solve the problem. As it turns out, they didn't need the computer. They gave it back to me. But I got something through the giving, and I got the first clue of it from the other place I'm working, where uh, everybody there has to give. More than one person has to use every computer. So you have a log on. You go to any computer in the place, sit down and log on. It has to be about giving. And when it is, the flow or the awareness of the flow increases. Okay? It's knowing that life is not something to get, but something to express. Your business is always the express business, no matter what name your worldly vocation may bear. And Mary Lou, come on. Maybe she has to sit in your coffee. All right. What, what just occurred to me in, in the discussion here is that when you are when you're in the your giving, we are an outlet to the inward. Yep. So we're we just say we're in the flow. And when we're in the flow, created by this come to us. Mm-hmm. And that created by the king to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something I could have known years ago. Yeah. It came when we needed to know it. And we could probably say, well, if that hadn't been your consciousness, you would go again. When you are giving, you always get something in the giving itself. It might not be something that you knew you needed. But once you have it, you'll recognize just how valuable it is to you. Now, if anybody said, can I borrow a computer for a while? I'll say, sure. Just give me two minutes to set it up for you. And away you go. And by the way, I've gotten down to only two computers. I had four, but I gave two of them away. And um, this was a, did I have four? Yeah, I had four. Um, I gave two of them away. And the people who got the two, one of them was... Uh, just a little bit out of date, it had a lot of miles on it, but it's got many more to go. And this person who received it, oh my God, just to see the joy on her face because uh, she's very giving soul. She's got kids, she's got a husband, she's got family. She's always giving, giving, giving. She needed something for herself. And I told her, tell your kids this is mom's computer, hands off. And she said, I will. So, um, it, it's really neat the way that works. I, I thoroughly recommend it. As a matter of fact, whenever you look around your house and you see something, you say, boy, I used to get a lot of use out of that, but I haven't used it in a year. Give it away. Give it directly to somebody that can use it if you know such a person. Or if you don't know such a person, find an organization to give it through who will find that kind of person. All right. If you want to work for the kind of consciousness that will maintain you in the giving flow, begin every day with this commitment. I will do what I do better and better, and I will do more and more of what I do. Now, when we use this affirmation, we get a dividend. In addition to discovering what it is that we do, we may discover that we're doing some things that we really don't need to be doing. Sometimes I'll say to people when they thank me for um, something I do for them, I'll say, it's just what I do. And it is. 
I am refining, and I've got a long ways to go in refining, but I am refining down to the point where I can say, this is what I do. This is how I invest my time for the good of humankind and the fulfillment of Tom Thorpe. If everybody focuses on what they do and finds people to do the things that uh, they don't do, then that increases the awareness of the flow. Okay? All right. We're going to finish a little early tonight. I owe it to you. Last slide. A truly giving consciousness is the creative alternative to the current emphasis on winning through intimidation or succeeding through positive selfishness. It's the better way. Do you remember Miracle on 34th Street? When Santa is speaking to a mother who's complaining about the high cost of a particular toy, and in both versions, the 1947 version and the 1990s version, Santa says, well, I understand that they have it for this price over at such and such a store. And so the woman goes and finds the store manager or the assistant manager. And she tells him the story, and he's horrified. But he begins to speak before she's done. And she said, any store that's got a Santa that will tell me where I can get a better buy on something they sell has my business. There's an insurance company that has my business for that reason, because they once told me that they could not give me as good a deal as the insurance company that we were using. This was for a church in California. And so now church mutual it is. Whenever I'm involved with a church, and I was so pleased to see that they're the company that's used here. A committed giver is an incurably happy person, a secure person, a satisfied person, and a prosperous person. There's a catch. You can't be tied to the response of the people who receive your gifts. When there is one and when it's positive, that's a bonus. You give your gift because you decided to give your gift. Once you've given it, it's out of your hands. It's not about you. It's about giving. You see, does that make sense? I hope it does. So, comments. That's right. It's a form of barter. It's a form of barter. I'll give you this so you will think more highly of me. Or I'll give you this so you will... Oh, I don't know. How many people... Um, especially people getting on in years, give gifts to their relatives so that they won't be forgotten, you know? Um, it's your way of being that makes you memorable. We've all known people who were just such a delight to be around that there's no way you'd forget them. We had somebody who had been a member of this church who had no children of his own, but he had nieces and nephews. And when he was in his final illness, they were there for him. They wanted to be. And that's important. Any other final comments as we come close to the end of our class tonight? Anything from anybody? Well then, since the chapter is about giving, it's only appropriate that we uh, receive our offering now. But we can only receive part of the offering here. We can only receive the money that's coming from the people who are in the class. Uh, if you're listening in another place and you want to give a financial offering, both truthunity.net and unityindependence.com have donate buttons on their homepage, and you take your choice. Both organizations have brought you this class tonight. Uh, but the money gift that you give is only a part of the gift. And much as I encourage it, I also encourage you not to stop with money. The whole gift is what we're talking about, and it includes every thought, word, and action that you dedicate to uplifting the consciousness of humankind. And so if you would take your offering in your hands, if appropriate, or in your heart, or both, we will bless the offering together. Divine love, as me and through me, 
blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, all that I receive, and my awareness of all that I am. This is so, and I rejoice that it is so. Amen. I pray you'll be with us next week at this same time when we bring our class to a close. Thank you for attending tonight. Namaskar.